Welcome to the Rehabilitation Collaborative Podcast, where we help our listeners build resiliency despite adversity. I'm your host, Dr. Chris Sovey, owner of Healthy Consumer Physical Therapy in Lansing, Michigan. In this podcast, we connect individuals and communities with resources and exceptional practitioners so they can transform their well being and become happier, healthier, more mobile, and strong. After listening, if you found the show valuable, be sure to follow our podcast so you never miss another episode again at anchor.fm slash rehab collab. That's anchor.fm slash R-E-H-A-B-C-O-L-L-A-B. And with that said, let's get on with the show. Well, welcome, Gretchen. Thank you, Chris. Great to be here. I'm so glad we could connect today. We're just going to have a little conversation. Just want to talk a little bit about you. I think you've got some fascinating things that that people would really love to hear about. Thank you. So first, I really respect what you do, but I also want to talk about what I think makes you unique as a person. You have a nice blend of many different things that, first of all, you're a oboe performer, concerto extraordinaire, and composer. Yes. Yes. And uh, definitely look up some of Gretchen's uh, recordings online. Those are out there. But most importantly, what people care about the most is that you are the mother of a celebrity dog here, Pilot, Mm -hmm. in the Lansing area. (laughs) Yes, Pilot the Rough Collie. Yes. (laughs) Who has accompanied you in neurofeedback, which we might talk a little bit about as well. (laughs) All right. (laughs) But mostly Pilot. Yeah. (laughs) Who are we kidding? He's really, he is a star in many, many ways. And he has a new little brother named Beacon. Beacon. Um, Yes. Well, why don't you tell us about Beacon? Uh, Beacon is a smooth coat collie. So the rough coat collie, think Lassie if you're old enough um, with the long hair and rescuing people all the time. Uh, Pilot has done a share of that. We, we used to work up in hospice and he, uh, you know, really helped a lot of people up there. Um, and now we have Beacon, because um, Pilot is 11 and a half and mm. doing well, but uh, I, I wanted him to help out training uh, the next dog. So Beacon is a smooth collie, which means a lassie dog with short hair. Um, so I don't have to do all the grooming, and um, mm. he's a lot easier to maintain in that way. Um, but he's still a beautiful dog, and very smart and uh pilot is jumping right in with uh <laughs> helping set limits and also teaching him some things mm. it's a whole lot easier to teach him to sit or do whatever you want when you've got an older dog that can show him the ropes so it has a mentor fun. yes yes mm. he really does mm. he really does so. i wondered if pilot would get territorial or not um a little bit but you know he's he is such a gentle soul he you know he he's so gracious with humans and bunny rabbits and kitty cats and dogs alike Mm. um uh but that being said um he has set a few of very appropriate limits i Mm. have a a wonderful pictorial series of uh beacon with his front end on the couch, um, initially trying to pull fur out of Pilot's mane and Pilot looking at me like, what is this maniac that you brought into my home? And the next picture is Beacon with his uh, jaws clamped on Pilot's uh, left paw and Pilot's right paw is on Beacon saying, watch it, bud. And the next picture is Beacon or uh, Pilot's full mouth on Beacon's head <laughs> saying, that's it, <laughs> you know, so. Wow. Yeah, he's, he's, he's not so territorial, but he's, he's, you know, saying, listen, this is how you need to behave, bud, so. There's almost a picture of him every day. Yes. Is there not? Yes, yes. <laughs> he has a very um, full and active life, and it's, it's yeah. kind of fun to document that and Absolutely. see the world through his eyes. Absolutely. Yeah. He's been a, a great therapy dog for many people in this community as yes. well. He's accompanied you and your practice. and Yes. Well, and he has introduced me to many people in my neighborhood who I you know, would have never met, and people all over the world that follow him online that I never would have met otherwise. So it's really, really lovely. Why Collies? Um, That's a great question. Um, I, years ago, 
um, had three rather significant tragedies in my life, um, mm. back to back. And, um, the last of which, um, uh, really presented some safety reasons, mm. um, safety issues. And so I started looking into a dog, um, that could go with me places, um, especially to work and back. Mm. And I was training with a local group in town with poodles and wasn't working really well. And um, I happened to find Quakerism as part of my own mm. uh, spiritual and healing journey and found out about some Quakers up near Alpena that had raised and trained collie dogs to be service dogs for 25, 30 years. And I called them and asked about it. And she said, well, we're not uh, accepting applications for another two years. And then it's a two year wait after that. But what do you need? And I told her my story and she said, you need a dog. And she said, I have this wonderful boy named Pilot and he's a white collie, which I had never heard of. And he is highly trained. He's brave. Um, he's funny and he's thoughtful. And not only will he not bark at people in your practice, but he'll go to who needs him. Mm. And she said, so if you ever want to meet him, and I said, when can I meet yeah. him? And so we put our calendars together. She needed to do some additional training with him. So we're, we're looking down the, down the line a bit. And literally the only date that worked was um, the same date as the initial pretty horrific tragedy in my life. And so it was really kind of a, serendipitous thing and a really heartfelt and wonderful thing to look forward to meeting this young boy on the anniversary of something horrible to, to try to kind of shift that um, feeling about that date. So, and I met him and I, I knew he was my dog. So it was just a, a wonderful, you know, meant to be kind of relationship there. So, yeah. Before you were practicing, you you had a very different path. I mean, in, in terms of your, your training as a musician, mm -hmm. tell us a story about that. How did you get from, from that to, from one musician to another? Were you afraid of becoming a starving musician or <laughs> well, ah. how did this, with, with all due respect, how did this come about that, that transition from going into oboe performance yeah. into neurofeedback? Yeah. For sure. Um, so I have a doctorate in music, um, also have a degree in education and have been interested in various learning styles for a long time. Um, I, when I graduated, I was playing uh, over 150 performances a year, um, you know, touring Broadway shows, um, professional orchestras in the area. Um, I had a teaching studio of 30 students. I was teaching at three colleges, and I was personnel manager of the symphony, and I was making $17,000 a year and mm. had no health benefits. Mm. And, um, you know, so so that was one thing, but, you know, when you love what you do, mm. you know, it that keeps you going. However, I had some health issues um, that were making it really difficult physically to do that much performing. Um, and then um, I had a really horrific family tragedy. Um, and at that point, that, that was the catalyst for change because in my head, I felt like, you know, I had needed so much help to recover from that mm. that I wanted to pass that on. Um, it, I, I needed deeper meaning, deeper purpose, in my life after that, I wanted to help people with things that they did not choose. Music is a choice. You can choose to listen to it. You can choose to perform it. But we all have things, you know, that have held us up from living the life that we would like um, that we didn't choose. And mm -hmm. I wanted to be there and help people through that. Um, after having a, a doctorate, you know, in another field, I was hesitant to jump into, you know, the schooling to be a physician or, um, you know, therapist, something like that. Um, and I got hooked up with a psychiatrist that wanted to add neurofeedback to her practice. And 
So she hired me and got me trained. And um, in the end, the training was still was like a whole nother degree, but at least a lot of it was hands on. And, um, you know, I learned a lot very quickly because I was working with people in the psychiatry practice who were not helped by talk therapy or medication. You know, they were falling through those cracks. And so they were really difficult cases. And I was lucky to have, you know, some great mentors to learn from, but certainly, you know, jumped right into the fire with the learning on that and uh, haven't turned back. Let's assume that those listening have never heard of neurofeedback, or maybe they haven't even heard of biofeedback. In the simplest way you could, how would you explain that to somebody? Like if, you know, you have your, your elevator pitch, what, what is neurofeedback to in layman's term? Absolutely. Um, so it is a form of biofeedback. And biofeedback is using a device to measure a body system that we don't normally think about, like our breathing or our blood pressure, our heart rate, our skin temperature. So if you were to, for example, wear a blood pressure cuff, and then do some visualization from that monitoring of the cuff you could learn what things start to bring your blood pressure down um, and so from that kind of feedback we can learn voluntarily voluntary control over body systems okay mm. so neurofeedback is biofeedback for the brain so we are measuring recording and responding to the electrical rhythms in your brain, and we can actually change them. Just as your heart has electrical rhythms, and when those rhythms are off, we can have any number of problems. The same thing with brain waves, and it's a it's a huge, wonderful tool that's you know really highly overlooked in a lot of areas, and I think you know, the medical community could really benefit from looking into that a, a little deeper, the, the use of the EEG a little bit deeper. What are the, what are the benefits that you see in, in people like from, from coming to see you, especially with neural feedback and tell us a story about yeah. someone's transformation? Well, there are, there are lots of stories. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing field. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, the, the neural feedback, you know, kind of the biggest, uh, shall we say, heading of neural feedback is stress reduction. And, of course, stress can affect most, you know, a, a lot of things, many, many, many things. Um, that being said, um, you know, it can also help things like sleep and physical issues, cognitive issues, focus, attention, impulsivity, um, pain, um, head pain, um, mood, uh, stress, all of those things. Um, so many things can be, you know, malleable um, and change through the process of neurofeedback. I would say, you know, like I say, there's so many fascinating stories, but one in particular um, was a young woman who called me up a few years ago. She's 19 years old. And um, she said her, her leg wasn't working well and that she was having to use a cane. And that's sort of an interesting reason for calling about neural feedback. And so she said, well, I, I, it happened to me three years ago when I was living in California and I had a few sessions of neural feedback then and um, it helped. So that really got me thinking, like, how did neural feedback help her leg? So... She came to the first session, the intake session, where we talk a lot about somebody's history and what got them to this point. And halfway through the interview, her roommates who, who brought her said, tell Gretchen why you're really here. And she said, she, you know, she kind of shut down and it took a while for her to, to really um, talk about this. But when she's out in public, she was seeing the Grim Reaper. Mm. And... Um, she was also starting to hear voices mm. and, you know, there was a, a trauma background there. And so you start thinking about, you know, um, some pretty significant diagnoses there, mm. you know, schizophrenia or something else. And 
So, okay, you know, we, we talked through that and um, we did the, the EEG recording. So in the EEG recording, somebody wears a, a full cap over their head. It's a stretchy nylon cap that has little sensors through the whole thing. We um, record data from 19 different sites on the brain. And the little sensors feed back the brain waves to, through an amplifier to my computer. And it, we get a pretty uh, complex um, recording, uh, really a state-of-the-art recording with lots and lots of data. And we look at the raw data, the squiggles of the EEG. You've probably seen you know, little examples of that. And it also turns the data into all sorts of maps and graphs and charts that we can you know, get information from. Well, in her raw data, um, looking through there, there was um, a little type of, um, shall we say, signature in the electrical rhythm that would correlate with um, very, very, very tiny seizure activity in the brain. Um, these are called absent seizures. Um, a lot of neurologists would probably ignore these in the EEG, but we look at them very seriously in our field because there's a feeling that those type of um, minute seizures are could be responsible for things like panic attacks or migraines or um, sudden unexplic unexplicable rage, things like that. Um, in this case, you could see the little signature of the seizure activity and then uh, she would blink her eyes. And, and so that's sort of a physiological reflex to having this sort of thing going on in the background in your brain and she'd blink her eyes and sort of write herself. Um, but having that information, um, we were able to detect where in her brain that was happening and give her frequencies that would um, be above the seizure range and so, and so to speak, speed her brain up in those areas. And literally within a couple weeks, she got rid of her cane and she was not seeing the Grim Reaper again and she was not hearing the voices. She was talking about how her job sucked and she needed to, you know, find a new one and she had to move out of her apartment, you know, like normal stresses instead of these, you know, really kind of scary stressors. Um, so that was, you know, a, a really interesting and exciting case with really terrific results and it and it really that's one of the reasons why I, I say I, I, I wish the medical community would, would look a little deeper into some of these um, tools that we have for uh, looking at people. I think if she'd gone to a hospital she may have had a very different result um, for treatment. Um, what do you think the hesitation is? Why, why do you feel like this hasn't been more widely adopted? I mean there it seems at least in my limited understanding, that there, there is a great amount of evidence for it. Yeah, there really... It's not like it hasn't been studied. Right, right. And, and, and it, it, isn't that interesting, you know? And, and here's a field where we can actually... That the science is there. And we can document pre and post results in terms of the EEG itself. Mm -hmm. How does the, the raw EEG look? And, and, and does the, do the maps change? You know, um, so we can demonstrate that. I know that in the field, we've struggled with the fact that a lot of times they want double blind, mm. you know, tests. And with neural feedback, it's hard to do that because we can't give everybody the same treatment. Every brain is different, and so the treatment is different. Mm. Um, so, but I, I still think, you know, there's, there's, there's room for a lot more acceptance there. Um, I, I work with leaders in the field who are who are really trying to, you know, push this data into greater acceptance. And um, we feel that it should really be more widely available. Is it changing over time? Do you feel like more people are, are becoming, are knowing about neurofeedback and it's becoming more accepted 
over absolutely, time? Absolutely, absolutely. No, no question about it. Um, leading uh, trauma researcher Dr. Bessel van der Kolk has written some 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 books and articles and done podcasts and um, uh, one of his uh, most popular books is The Body Keeps the Score, um, and he references neural feedback as being able to go places with trauma that he has not ever been able to go in mm -hmm. with conventional uh, means. And so more people in the trauma community are certainly becoming aware of it. Um, the Mayo Clinic um, a few years back had a, a, a special publication of um, alternative therapies, and they rated them you know, in terms of, uh, you know, f safety and efficacy, and they, you know, feedback was, was very highly rated in, in their book. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's coming along. Um, we're getting some, some good backers behind it. The uh, American um, Pediatric Association has listed neural feedback as a uh, a best practice for ADD, ADHD. Yeah. Um, so you know we're getting we're getting some boosts there. Yeah, for sure. I think you and I, uh, our professions are trying to do similar things in a different way. I think physical therapists are are becoming more aware, and especially as our training expands, about the importance of treating the nervous system, even for physical like orthopedic kind of injuries. And so we do a lot of things that are trying to, in some way, influence the nervous system, not quite as direct. There's many gentle techniques. What I'm interested in, and I feel like a lot of people would be interested in, is how can, you had mentioned trauma, you had mentioned um, you know, ADD, ADHD, and several different, several different stress-related disorders and, and pathologies, things like that. How could neural feedback be used to help someone with chronic pain, especially if that population is particularly, and rightfully so, skeptical, nervous, that anything is going to work for them. So if someone is skeptical or they're nervous, they're kind of like, oh, this is interesting. They're listening to this. They're like, oh, this is kind of interesting, but I've tried everything. It doesn't work. How is this going to be any different? Not that you have to promise that you're going to get results for them, but how can neural feedback work with chronic pain? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. You know, how can this help chronic pain? I, I want to start off by saying that um, my colleagues and I have, you know, uh, numerous times received reports from people that have already been doing body work elsewhere with people like yourself or um, chiropractors or massage therapists. Um, after they start the neural feedback, they'll, they'll come back and say, my, my body worker said, oh my gosh, I can finally adjust to this part mm. on here. I can move this vertebrae and I could never move it before. Well, internally, deeply internally, their nervous system is finally letting go. You know, so many people, um, you tell them to relax, they don't know what it means. You know, they have to experience that relaxation on a very deep level um, internally, which, which sometimes neurofeedback can help them do. Um, in addition to that, I mean, Pain is complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, um, you know, the actual injury itself or the, the location of the pain, but there's this, this dance that happens between where that injury is in the body and also the brain and the spinal cord, right? There's lots of different networks in the brain and regions in the brain that all kind of, you know, are players in either holding on to pain or releasing pain. And um, we're learning more and more about what, who and what those players are and how we might address that. And like anything else, like a behavior or thought pattern, pain can become entrenched in the brain um, and, and sort of um, uh, immortalized there in, in some ways. And so sometimes with the neural feedback, um, if we can target some of those areas that may be involved or simply, again, by just reducing stress, we can get a relief of a, of a pain pattern. Mm. We really appreciate you spending time with me today, Gretchen. I've, I've learned a lot from you and 
and really respect what you do. And I'm sure we could go on for much longer, but people would turn this off. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I understand. I, and I'm, I'm happy to speak with you. I love talking about this stuff. I think yeah. it's really exciting. And I think as, you know, as a society, we're going to hear more and more about neurofeedback. I have to imagine so too. Yeah. I'm taking time. If people like what they're hearing and they wanted to learn more about you and, and what you do, what's, what's the best way that they could find you? Uh, I would say look online. Um, Mid Michigan Neural Feedback is my website. Um, you can even see a picture pilot on there that we talked about at the beginning. <laughs> um, there's a lot of links on there to different articles that would talk to um, neural feedback for specific, specific conditions um, or symptoms. Um, there's some examples of brain maps on there. Um, uh, an example of how we how the process works in terms of how we do it and all sorts and also contact information to email or phone me with any questions that you have thanks so much for being with me today Gretchen thanks for having me I really appreciate it thanks Chris thanks so much for listening today and before you go be sure to follow our podcast so you never miss out on another episode again at anchor.fm slash rehab collab you can also find us on Spotify. We currently post on the first and third Thursday of each month, so be sure to check back then. If you'd like to learn more about what the Rehabilitation Collaborative is up to, you can also find us on facebook.com slash rehabcollab.